Here we're looking at two LC circuits. Yeah, L for inductance, C for capacitance, in series and in parallel. They're the same size inductors in both, same size capacitors, same frequency, so they end up with the same ohmic values. You can practice with those calculations if you want. Now, I want to look at basically what's the effect when we just have reactive components, no resistors. Okay, well, let's take a look here. I have two ohms and six ohms. How do I add those together? Yeah, I've got the vectors drawn up proportionally already. And sure enough, the two ohms is going to point up because as a reminder, I put the I here in a series circuit. Current is the same everywhere. And so therefore it is my reference. And the inductor's voltage leads the current and therefore those vectors point up for the inductor. The capacitor's voltage would lag the current and therefore they point down. Let me put the values on here. Because the vectors directly oppose each other, I simply take the two ohms away from the six ohms. And I'm left with four ohms of total reactance. Okay? They're down here in the capacitor's territory, these four ohms. So I put it right here. That's all there is, is reactive components. So my total reactance is the same as my Z. Right, that's the total circuit opposition made up of these two. And from this perspective, from the circuit, circuit source, it looks as though it's just a capacitive circuit with four ohms. The inductor is there just to counterbalance some of these ohms. But that's what that looks like, that's all it is. Four ohm circuit. Could I figure out the current? Volts divided by ohms, give me amps. 30 amps. Now. You could take that 30 amps and put it here and here, right? Series circuit, same current. Figure out your voltage drops and your power values, and they, those vectors would be proportional. Again, just reactive components, no resistive values. Okay. Let's look at the parallel. Now over here, remember we don't have ohm values in the vectors, and I can't, when I have a capacitor and an inductor. I can't just take the six minus the two or anything like that. I do have a mathematical formula I can use. We'll talk about that in class. But the way I prefer to do it with these pictures and the circuits and vectors is to calculate the currents, get the total current, and then use volts divided by amps to give me ohms. That's how we'll do it here. So what do we have here? Volts divided by ohms, give me amps. Same on the capacitor. I'm gonna calculate those out and put them on here. But which is gonna point which direction? Just as a reminder, voltage is the reference. Same on every branch in a parallel circuit. Since voltage is the reference, which current leads the voltage? Capacitive or inductive? The capacitive current leads the voltage and the inductor's current lags the voltage. So remember in parallel, they flip. Capacitor top, inductor bottom. 60 amps here, 20 amps here. And we've talked before of how these, the smaller amount will just dance back and forward between the two because of the opposite nature of the current flow. The 20 amps will dance back and forward and the circuit needs to kick in the difference. So 20 amps is taken away from 60 the difference is 40 amps. And because there's no resistor to do the Pythagorean theorem with, then we end up just with 40 amps is all the circuit has to kick in. It's just the reactive components. And what's that gonna look like? It's gonna look like 40 amps going to, well, those 40 amps are pointing down into inductive territory, right? Here, inductive is up top. In parallel, it's down, pointing down. So it's gonna to appear to the circuit as if these 40 amps are inductive. So the question now becomes, which is which? Is this more capacitive or more inductive? More capacitive, more inductive? And the real quick way to do it is biggest vector wins. What's the bigger vector? Well, there's more capacitive reactants than there is inductive reactants. And the vectors here represent ohms. 
So this is going to show more capacitive. The vectors over here, I have to look at current. And there's more current flow on the inductor. So it appears inductive to the circuit. Biggest vector wins. This is more capacitive. This is more inductive. A couple other things I want to look at. I want to look at power. Oh, first of all, I've got my Z here. How would I figure that out? Can I do volts divided by amps? Sure. Three ohms. And if you look in your textbook and in class, we'll talk about it in a mathematical formula from six and two, we would get three with that. But here we're focusing on the picture angle on this 40 amps at 120 volts means there is three ohms, total circuit ohms. Yeah. Gotta be careful how we look at these ohms so we don't just try and subtract or add or do something like that with them. Okay, now power. Well, the power vectors would be proportional to these guys on both sides, and we would end up with just reactive power, right? Vars capacitive. VAR is inductive. Likewise over here. I don't have any resistor, and therefore do I have any true power? Do I have any watts? No. Watts are dissipated or consumed across a resistor or a resistive component. So what's my power factor equation? What's that going to mean for a power factor here? Let me draw that equation. Power factor always is watts over VA, true power over volt amps, right? We have shortcuts in series and parallel to, to, to achieve our fa power factor value or earlier in the analysis process, but it's always watts over VA, true power over apparent. And do we have any watts here? No, these are just VARs and VARs, 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 no watts. So if my watts are zero, what does my power factor have to be? Zero percent. There's no real work getting done. No heat, no light, no motion as we think about it. And because my net vector is 90 degrees away from the reference, you could also do the cosine, right? Power factor is cosine theta. And if you do cosine of 90 degrees, or this one's 90 degrees down, Cosine of 90 will equal zero. Okay. One other thing I'm considering. What happens then in this case with LC circuits if the capacitive vector and the inductive vector, depending on which circuit, are the same length? If they were the same length, they would cancel each other out. And I would be left with what? A dot. So in this sense, if they were the same length, I would be left with no ohms. Well, if there are no ohms, it would be like a short circuit. And that's how the circuit reacts. And in parallel, well, if there's no current flowing, there actually would be current flowing right here, but there would be no current needed from the source because they would be equal. Right? If the vectors were the same, the current would be equal, and it would just dance back and forward. Neither component needing any more from the source. So you would just be able to open the circuit, and they would just keep dancing. Of course, that's theoretical. There's a resistance in the wire that would slow it down. But in theory, it would keep going. So how would I do that? Well, in this case, I'd have to increase the frequency. Let me draw a couple of formulas. XL, 2 pi for life. XC, 1 over 2 pi for cats. So, in order for XL to equal XC, and would that be the same here? Would the currents be the same if the ohms were the same? Well, yeah, the same voltage pushing down each, over the same opposition, if these were the same, would result in the same current flow. So I need the XL and the XC to be the same there also. So I'm basically asking for this 
to be equal to this. And there's a formula I have for that. Resonant frequency, we'll call that the frequency at which XL and XC, and the same here, the frequency where XL and XC are equal to each other. That's basically a simplification of that formula. And if we do this with L being the inductance in Henry's, take note these are millis, and the capacitance in farads, take note these are micro, if we put those in there and we solve this, what would we get? What frequency would I have to apply this at in order to get the same value on both? Well, solve this out and what do we get? It would be 104 hertz. So if I put 104 hertz here, I increased the oscillations, right? The AC, the positive, the negative, oscillating from positive to negative. If I packed more of them in a second and speed it up to 104 cycles per second, then this formula is telling me that my XL and my XC would equal each other. Let's just do a quick test to see if we think that's in the ballpark. What happens if I increase this frequency? If my frequency goes up, what happens to XL? Two pi for life, it's a direct proportion, uh, uh, directly proportional. XL would increase. What would happen to XC? Remember, if frequency goes up, XC goes the other way. XC would go down. So at least we know we're moving in the right direction. We've got to be higher than 60 in order for this to be greater than two ohms and this to be less than six ohms. And at a certain point, if we keep increasing it, apparently to 104 hertz, then if I put 104 hertz in my two pi for life with this inductance and one over two pi for cats with this capacitance, I should end up with ohms that are very similar to each other. If you want to work that out on your own, you should end up with XL and XC equaling about 3.46 ohms is what you would end up with. I'll leave that for you to calculate. And in the next video, I'm going to actually look at series and parallel LC circuits and see, see them at resonant frequency and then see above and below resonant frequency. What characteristics do I expect? But this has kind of led us into that. Sure enough, at resonant frequency, I would end up with no ohms here. It'd be like a short circuit. And I would end up with no current flowing here from the source. I would have current here, but it would appear to the source like an open circuit because it wouldn't need to send any ohms in there. Obviously, we'd have to change all these numbers. We'll look at those concepts a little more in the next video.